We take for granted our bouncy, shiny hair when we are young. Oftentimes, in our 30s or 40s and on up, our hair changes. I feel like there is a scarcity in accurate information on this topic, and that's why I'd like to address the reasons for this and what you can do about it. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Issa, and if you haven't seen my channel before, I talk about skincare and specifically love the subject of preserving your beauty when you hit your 30s, 40s, and on up. I feel like everything on YouTube was either for people in their teens and 20s, and no one specifically targets this time in a woman's life. So here I am. I am taking my life experiences and my medical background to clarify them for you. So many of my friends have had serious changes in their hair in terms of color, texture, and density, and they never really get the right answers, oftentimes even when they visit the doctor. Unless you go to a dermatologist that really knows about this problem, it's really hit or miss if your doctor can help you. It is really very important to understand the causes of why your hair changes so that you know how to direct treatment. So let's get into it. It's really important to understand the four cycles of hair, which include the antigen phase or the growing phase, which can last from two years to eight years. This phase generally refers to about 85 to 90% of the hair on your head. The catagen phase or transition phase is the time that the hair follicles shrink and the hair usually stays in the state for about two to three weeks. The telogen phase or resting phase takes about two to four months. At the end of this phase, the hair falls out. This is followed by another antigen phase when a new hair regrows. Hair loss actually affects more than 50% of women by the age of 50. So if you are seeing changes in your hair, especially after 30, you're definitely not alone. Hair loss in women often has a greater impact than hair loss does on men because it's less socially acceptable for them. Alopecia can severely affect a woman's emotional well-being and quality of life. So the number one reason for hair loss is actually genetic. A condition known as androgenic alopecia or androgenetic alopecia or female pattern hair loss. These are all the same things. This begins with gradual thinning right at the part line, followed by increasing diffuse hair loss radiating from the top of the head. The hair loss from androgenetic alopecia occurs because of a genetically determined shortening of the antigen phase, which is the hair's growing phase and a lengthening of the time between the shedding of a hair and the start of a new antigen phase. That means that it takes longer for hair to start growing back after it is shed in the course of a normal growth cycle. The hair follicle itself also changes, shrinking and producing a shorter, thinner hair shaft, a process called follicular miniaturization. As a result, thicker, pigmented, longer-lived, terminal hairs are replaced by shorter, thinner, non-pigmented hairs called vellus hairs. So it is thought that the follicle is sensitive to male hormones. This is not to say that these women have an overabundance of male hormone, but just that the follicles are very sensitive to it. However, it may be worthwhile to have your hormones checked this type of condition may worsen after you reach menopause. So other reasons for hair loss include changes in hormones. One very common time a woman may experience a drastic hair fallout is about six to 12 weeks after having a baby. This postpartum fallout is present in about 50% of women and the thickness of your hair may change drastically, but returns to normal after some time. The reason for this is that during pregnancy, a woman has an abundance of estrogen, which keeps all your hairs in that prolonged antigen phase or that growing phase. 
And so after you deliver the baby, the hair goes back to its regular cycle and goes into the telogen phase. And this is the fallout phase and naturally fall out. But this is followed by a new hair growing out of the same follicle. So usually things go back to normal. Hypothyroidism or an underactive thyroid usually has other symptoms like being overly tired, weight gain, and dry skin. Also, PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, can cause an abnormal increase in testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, which affects the hair follicle and causes the hair to be finer and finer and then fall out. Symptoms may include increased body hair, oily skin, inability to get pregnant, and a deepened voice. This is actually a very common problem in the US and other countries as well. In my practice, I see a lot of women with this problem and their hair loss can be pretty extensive. The good news for them is that it can improve with a proper treatment for PCOS, which may include weight loss, spironolactone, and sometimes birth control and a drug called metformin, which helps with insulin sensitivity. Another reason for thinning or losing hair are certain hairstyles. Hair that is styled in ways that pull on the roots, like a really tight ponytail, braids, or cornrows. Tight or heavy hair extensions can also be a culprit. This type of hair loss is called traction alopecia. If hair follicles are damaged or scarred down, the loss can be permanent. However, if it is caught in time, this can be reversed. The problem lies in the fact that this constant pulling on the hair causes loosening of the hair from the follicles. And sometimes other symptoms on the scalp can be seen, including bumps, redness, and tenderness. Again, this is important to recognize because with time, it may get scarred down and will never regrow. This type of hair loss is common among people with skin of color, especially African-American women, although it may be seen among all ethnic groups. Ballerinas, gymnasts, military personnel, and certain professionals who are required to the, wear their hair pulled back may develop traction alopecia. A third type of hair loss includes a problem called telogen effluvium. At any time, about 85% to 90% of hairs on the average person's head are actively growing, which is the antigen phase, and the others are resting in the telogen phase. In a person with telogen effluvium, some body change or shock pushes more hairs into the telogen phase. Typically, in this condition, about 30% of the hairs stop growing and go into a resting phase before falling out. So if you have telogen effluvium, you may lose an average of 300 hairs a day instead of 100. Telogen effluvium can be triggered by a number of different events, including surgery, major physical trauma. Some women experience this after running a marathon, for example, because it's just so demanding on your body, um, a high fever, a severe infection, or other illnesses. And even extreme weight loss is known to put you into telogen effluvium. Also, uh, major changes in your diet. Uh, another common one is major psychological stress, such as a death in the family, a divorce, and other events. Um, it's, so it's really important to talk to someone about stressors if you do, not, if you do have a traumatic uh, event in your life. Another common one is a major psychological stress, such as a death in the family or a divorce. It is important to talk to someone about stressors if you do have a traumatic experience, because this can really help. Because hairs that enter into the telogen phase rest in place for two to four months before falling out, you may not notice any hair loss until two to four months after the event that caused the problem. Telogen effluvium rarely lasts longer than six months, although some cases may last longer. Although losing a great number of hairs within a short amount of time can be really frightening, the condition is usually temporary. Each hair that is pushed prematurely into telogen phase is replaced by a new growing hair, so there is no danger of complete baldness. 
Typically in this condition, about 30% of the hairs stop growing and go into the resting phase before falling out. Because hair on the scalp grows slowly, your hair may feel or look thinner than usual for some period of time, but fullness will return as the new hair grows in. Toxic substances including chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and some medications can also cause sudden hair loss that can occur anywhere on the body. This happens to hair in the growth phase and is called antigen effluvium. So there are certain medications like blood pressure medications um, such as beta blockers, also seizure medications, and H2 blockers for acid reflux that may inhibit iron absorption can cause this problem. Also, one big one these days is methamphetamines. Um, for example, Ritalin, prescribed for attention deficit disorder. This can put you into antigen effluvium and cause you a great deal of hair loss. Also, nutritional deficiencies can influence hair thinning and hair loss. Certain diets which drastically lower calorie intake can be a problem. Also, a diet low in protein can definitely affect the density and texture of your hair. Iron is also very important for your hair. Vegans and vegetarians are at higher risk for this problem. The requirements for dietary iron are considered to be 1.8 times higher than that for meat consumers. Non-heme iron found in plants has a lower bioavailability than heme iron found in meat and fish. I know that veganism and vegetarianism is on the rise, and I totally support this choice but please make sure you're getting proper iron. Other nutrients that are important for hair include zinc, certain fatty acids like omega-6 and omega-3s. Also, vitamins A, D, and E are important, but really there are no human studies that prove a deficiency can cause hair loss. Biotin is also a common supplement people take for their hair, but truthfully, there are no real studies that prove that supplementation will help. Generally speaking, it's very difficult to have a biotin deficiency unless you have a genetic defect or a gastrointestinal problem. If you see patchy hair loss on your head, this could be an autoimmune skin disease and is usually not permanent, but you should refer to your doctor or dermatologist for treatment of this. With this problem, your physician may want to prescribe a steroid injection to help. So how do you know if you're having normal hair shedding or real hair loss? It is normal to have 50 to 100 hairs fall out in one day, but usually if you notice more, for example, on your brush, on the floor, in the shower drain, or on your pillows, you also may notice the hair part getting wider, um, then this is a good indication that something's wrong. There are some good treatments and things you can do to help your hair health, but for the sake of time, I will talk about these on another video. But it is truly important to understand and try to know the origin of the problem before you move on to treatments. And I really recommend talking to your medical practitioner um, or your doctor about this. So I hope you learned and enjoyed from this. Please leave me a comment below and tell me what other topics you're interested to hear. It's really important for me to get this feedback from you so that I know what you guys want to hear and I can be guided on exactly what you guys want. Stay well and stay beautiful. I'll see you later. Bye.